before we move on to Regina, I just want to remind people that we are looking for you to give us questions to uh, to address to the panel, and uh, you have a, a piece of paper I think in your uh, in your program, and to jot down a question and hand it to someone in the aisle. They'll be glad to bring it down here. Okay, Regina. Well, I'm very glad to hear that you're planning on investing more in, in mentoring than in monitoring because that's what teachers need. They need mentors, not monitors. And the monitoring of teachers in classrooms from outside agencies has gotten completely out of hand. Um, I can give a very clear example of this from my own classroom earlier this year. I failed blocks. Um, or my, my classroom failed the early childhood environment rating scale more infamously known as, as Eckers, for my block area. Now, my block area is a lovely place, and children come and build there all the time. But I also have a reptile named Titan, and he lives in a terrarium above blocks. And the monitor from Eckers, according to the monitor from Eckers, the children went over to look at the reptile, since this interfered with block play. Credit could not be given for this space as a special block area. Th this would be funny. Th this, yeah, it would be funny, but this is a criteria that, that classrooms and teachers are being <coughs> judged on. And if I were a, a new, inexperienced teacher and I had an administrator who wanted to know, how come you failed blocks, then I might feel compelled to remove my reptile. But because I've been a teacher a long time, and I had great mentors, and I had Bank Street, I know how much Titan, the blue tongue skink, adds to the life of our classroom. <laughs> that the children talk to him, and they build things for him in blocks, and they explain it to him, and extend their vocabularies and their imaginations. They write stories about him, and for him, and they tape him up to his terrarium. So new teachers need to be working with mentors on a weekly basis. A and I know this is a radical idea, but they should be working with experienced teachers. Yes, it would be expensive, but the failure of UPK would be much more expensive. Um, I also think we could have a huge savings on all these outside contractors. Um, Oh, sorry, Monitor, uh, monitors are telling teachers what they need to do in classrooms without any real understanding of individual classrooms. And while the DOE may want progressive play-centered pre-K programs, it is not being properly translated through Eckers or the classroom assessment scoring system or unsupported teachers' ability to create a bundle based on the pre-K common core. Um, because the classrooms that will come out of that will have teachers trying to drill phonemic awareness and then play will be lost. So I, I agree, you need a framework to help new teachers understand what a good early childhood class, classroom looks like, but you need to have freedom within that framework if you want to attract and keep creative people in the field of education. Thank you. Just, just one, uh, and I, I appreciate that, and I, and I think, I mean, it's a funny story, but a funny story making a very serious point. Um, and the only thing I would say is that, uh, and, and not at all to discount the point, but I do want to, I also do want to make the point that part of our job in a public system like this, where we are spending uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money, um, and where we're going to be held accountable for whether these programs achieve long-term ends, is that as a system, we do need a way of understanding whether we're delivering quality in the system, um, particularly in a system which relies on a large number of partnerships, some large and sophisticated, um, like Goddard Riverside, uh, but others not large and not as sophisticated, who need support. Uh, and in building that quality, and in building a system that allows us to have confidence about where quality is, not so that we can penalize teachers or penalize programs, but that we can understand where teachers need the kind of coaching and mentoring support you described, um, we are driven to use evidence-based practices that um, research tells us are correlated with quality and the long-term outcomes in children that we're trying to achieve. And so all that to say that nothing is perfect and no implementation is perfect. 
Um, but as we think about how a monitoring system can go crazy, we also shouldn't uh, forget the importance of having a robust system of, you know, monitoring is a, is a tough word, but monitoring um, to make sure that quality is being achieved, but also to make sure that we are directing support resources as appropriately so that the teachers and the classrooms and the sites that need the most support are actually getting it. Can I, I, I know you're not disagreeing with no, that. No, I just want to. No, no. Yeah. Can I respond to that though? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I agree. I, I, I definitely think, but I think if you have mentors working with teachers on an ongoing basis, um, I, I really think it would have to be in the classroom every week. Well, then they would be able to have an understanding. I would be perfectly happy to have a, someone who understands education or has been a teacher come into a classroom and do Eckers. I've done Eckers on classrooms. Mm -hmm. But I also do them with an understanding of, of what their purpose is. And th this was a person who had actually, one of the people who had written the book. So for, for not to have, a, to have a misunderstanding, understanding of an educative experience seems to me to be the wrong way to go. And part of our job, I think, is to have, for example, and I know with DOE is hired, the Department of Education is hiring coaches now, it's, about, it's part about who you hire. Right. And so those coaches, those mentors, have to be the right people. They have to have an appreciation for the joy of education. For play. We have to understand how um, these tools intersect with the reality of the classroom. So I think part of that, the lesson I take from that, I think, is a um, board of people who are doing this work matters. It's not enough just to have a system. Having to have a system implemented by people who know what they're doing and understand what the purpose of the system is. And, and I would add, I think what we, what we want to look for is that come to it with the spirit that the Deputy Mayor expressed, which is one of trying to figure out where su additional support is needed and not using it as something to penalize or, or micromanage teachers, right? Great. All right, let me bring one more question to you. And since this is a higher education institution where we are, we can think thoughts that um, might not be exactly practical, all right, but idealistic or... <laughs> You know, in, important all the same. So this is called UPK. And in New York State, you had no choice anyhow, because UPK has been around a long time. Even if it hasn't been very universal, but it's been around. We all know that. <coughs> uh, but the notion or the question of universality is an important question, especially with the children we're talking about as our really our primary targets. Since the early days of Head Start, there's been controversy about whether public support for early childhood should be targeted to those most in need or be made universally available. And we do need to contend with the fact that some children come from homes where parents are economically and educationally not in a good position to assist and help, support, strengthen, and, and help their children to thrive. But we also know that preschool can be an important foundation for everyone, and we know that there are economic reasons as well for middle class parents to need help in this. And so strong arguments can be, can, can be made on both sides of the universal targeted debate. And given that there are limited economic resources, despite the fact that there are hundreds of millions of dollars here, there are tens of thousands of children, and there are uneven needs among New York's children, Let's talk a little bit about this universal versus targeted matter, and let, let's start, uh, if we can, with Rich. So, you know, I thought by sitting in the middle, <laughs> I would avoid being asked any questions. For... I know. You've been a teacher before, I see. Um, <laughs> so I, I think um, I will start by saying, obviously, Mayor Bill de Blasio, um, we start by, he's made a choice, right? And, and his choice is for universality. And, and so there's a few thoughts I have about this question, which I, I do think is a central critical question and smarter people than me um, have been uh, weighing with for some time, right? So one thing I will say is that we start with the notion that we are not choosing between quality and quantity. So the premise of having a universal system as opposed to the targeted system, I think the first premise is that you have the resources to actually build a high quality universal system. So I start with that. You know, the, the, the bonus of Mayor de Blasio's charge that I, he didn't want the money for a targeted system, he wanted the money for every four-year-old to have a quality education system. He went out, the city went out, 
and got most of that money, right? So I start from there. And if we did not get that money, it's possible that we'd be facing a different choice right now. But I, so I start with the premise that um, universal, universality for us implies the resources to build a system of quality uh, that is universal. Um, you mentioned the, the very serious benefits for middle class families and the, and the middle class parent, uh, the, the very real benefits for middle class parents, of, uh, particularly in a city like New York. Um, we can't underestimate um, the value that provides to the broad populace. And I think, again, um, that's part of the value here. Um, we can't underestimate the value of having a army of parents, uh, middle class parents, upper middle class parents who are invested in a quality system and what that means for the long term political battle um, because this is a long term political battle um, to make sure that the resources are here and they grow um, because again, although this is a massive step forward, there's more we want to do. Um, so I, I would not underestimate the importance of building that constituency over the long term. And I would also say that there is um, uh, the power of building targeting within a universal system. And so having a universal system does not mean that we're not building a system which is targeting families with particular needs. What it means is that um, we have, uh, we're more likely to have those children in a long-term sustainable funded system and to have access to them to target their needs. Um, you know, I, I, you talked about, uh, I came from a meeting prior to this about the Children's Cabinet, which is an effort, another multi-agency effort to improve uh, child safety and child well-being. Um, and one of the things that we know is that having children um, exposed to other adults in a system like this are one of the things that we can do to keep children safe. So there, there are broad value to having children in a system like this, um, targeted or untargeted, that even go beyond the educational benefit of an early childhood system. So I think it's a valid question. I think that the argument for a universal system are strong. Um, I think that uh, we were able to go out and get the resources to build a quality universal system. And I think over the long term, it'll prove to be in the best interest of the health of the system as a whole. Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll add a few, um, uh, just a few short thoughts about um, why I think the, the choice to go for a universal system is, is the right one and why I think um, from a policy perspective, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I guess I would, these are, and these are points that mostly I, I take from Steve Barnett, um, who made them first a few years ago in a very powerful piece that he wrote about this very choice. I mean, I, I think that one of, the, one of the great features of a universal program is that you can take what you would have invested in the machinery of trying to discern which children are eligible for said program or not, um, and invested in quality and in serving you know, children in, in a high quality way. And I think that's a significant step forward. Um, and those of us who have, you know, all of us here have worked in, in, um, in programs with you know, challenging eligibility requirements that require a lot of, of time and energy on the part of, of families and the staff that's trying to work with them to sort of sort this out. And that's also energy that could be put into building better classroom experiences and better professional development. And, and so I think that a part of the power of a universal program is that that apparatus and the resources that would have gone into that can be invested more wisely. Um, that's not to say that in some cases it doesn't make sense for to have a means, you know, a means tested or targeted program. And in fact, New York City con will, will continue to have that for birth through three. Um, um, and. Uh, uh, um, and so, but we have to, we're making choices. And so I think in this case, we're gonna demonstrate the power of, of a universal program. I think the other um, policy point to make is that despite all of the investments made in that targeting, um, there's good evidence to suggest that we miss the mark um, because it's hard to do well. And so there are families um, that should be served by such a program that don't wind up getting served because they don't make it through um, the apparatus to determine eligibility, that happens. And in this case, um, we have a system that can serve, you know, that will serve all families. Um, and, and, um, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll achieve those successes for all children. I guess I would also say that um, I was sort of impressed by, um, this was a survey that was recently released um, by uh, Hiro Yoshikawa at NYU and, 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 and many other colleagues 
um, that, that took a lot of uh, research into account and, and made the statement that we all knew to be true but, but was validated um, through, through his work that you know, middle class children benefit a great deal from, from these programs and that more importantly the investment that government makes in uh, providing pre-kindergarten for middle class children outweighs the costs and so there's a powerful public policy case to be made uh, for a universal program from that vantage point alone that um, we as a city will do better for having made that investment and we will see the returns on that investment um, if that's the way you want to look at the world, um, you, we will see the returns on that investment in terms of these better educational outcomes and better outcomes for our children and families across the board. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I would sort of conclude by saying that as we have rolled this out, um, we have seen such enthusiasm and excitement um, from families all over the city. Um, and so it, as we do this work and as we communicate with uh, organizations and families and teachers around the city, it, it is actually getting harder to imagine a world in which we um, tell people that they don't qualify for some reason. I mean, it, it, is, it is becoming, as we do this, um, something that is becoming part of um, the hope and expectation of every parent, which is a very powerful thing, I think, for, uh, for this work. So I think well, for all those reasons, it's, a, it's a, going to turn out to be a very powerful and good choice. And Regina? I mean, I guess I have more, more questions than anything else about how it will work. Um, I believe in universal pre-K, but I also believe in the, the support that we give our families and target agencies. So how will, how will it look in, in a community-based organization? How will a pre-K program look there? Will it, will it be a 180-day a UPK day? And how will it? How will that work with the rest of the, the program? Sure, sure. I'll take a first. I'll take a first shot. Um, I'd like to know. Um, he gets to do that. That's fine. Uh, so, he, so he asked. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, that's true. So, uh, I mean, the answer is the f that yes. I mean, what we are doing is we are funding um, um, a 180-day universal pre-kindergarten day. Um, that's for, you know, that, that is, um, um, uh, you know, six hours and 20 minutes long. Um, that is what we were, that's what we got funding to do, and that was what the, the mayor promised to do uh, um, during his campaign and as we pushed for the resources to make this vision a reality. Um, so how will that play out in the various organizations that provide it? It will, it will be, um, it will vary depending on the organization. And I think um, that is part of the strength of our system, that it's diverse and, and that um, different organizations will, will, will make um, different choices and make different arrangements for families. And it will be a source of learning for us as we move forward because as the deputy mayor said, this is not a point in time implementation. Um, we are on a fast track, but we understand that we will be learning as we go uh, and we will be building the system over time. Uh, so some agencies uh, have, through other funding streams, um, the ability to provide other services to those same families, um, which, will, um, which will certainly, it, particularly in high-need neighborhoods, will be working with community-based organizations that have a lot of other programmatic offerings for those families. Um, in, and in some cases, you know, families will find that the six-hour and 20-minute day works for them. Um, we will be listening and learning as we go and trying to help make adjustments to serve the most number of families we can um, the best way possible. Um, and so that's part of the dialogue that we're engaged in uh, and part of the work that we have in front of us. So can I ask yeah, go another ahead, question? Uh, so so f we have parents calling now who are asking if they can enroll their children in our Goddard Riverside Head Start program. For, they said, well, you're listed in UPK. And I, we are listed in UPK, but we are also a Head Start program. Mm -hmm. So are we considered no longer a Head Start program? Or should, do we not take the children? Or do we take the, the children that fall below the poverty level first? You see what I'm, it's, it's, there's a confusion in, I think, at least for me, in the community-based organizations about what that's gonna, this is gonna look like in September for us. 
Well, I, I guess I would say I don't know I, I don't know enough about the specifics of your funding streams and how they work together to answer the question um, very well up, uh, okay. at the moment. But I do think I can say with confidence that the you know the Department of Education has a wonderful team of about 175 people now and growing um, that are working every day to implement this, including field offices in, in, in three of our boroughs whose job it is to work with um, um, not-for-profit organizations like yours to sort this out. Um, and we are actively doing that at, you know, today, um, meeting with community-based organizations, talking if they've applied for UPK, and talking through th those arrangements. Um, and so we'll try to work with you to figure it out. I don't know the answer. I, mean, I, I don't think it's just um, yeah, God yeah. of Riverside. I think we're all in the early learn contract in CBO, so. Ah. Oh, well, this is, that's yeah, so what is that? that is complicated, but there is, in fact, a lot of background on graded funding, both here, I'm sure, and elsewhere, and uh, and that's something that you got to work out yeah. clearly. Yeah. yeah, we could. I mean, I don't want to take the time here, but we can talk to you more about how it works for early loan funding. Uh, There'll be a lot of people more, to talk yeah. to, I think, yeah. right? Because because that's the way that early childhood has been pieced together. Mm -hmm. But I do I do want to say I mean not. I think the broad picture is, I, I do want to say, if I do feel like we're all in this together, right? So inevitably, somebody's going to have a question that somebody at the Department of Education didn't come up with the answer to. And we should not view this as an adversarial city, um, I, as I, wonderful I as you so. and your colleagues are. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't want to ever feel like there's an adversarial process. We have to feel like we're together. We're going to work through these complex problems to build a great system for our kids, and we're going to figure it out together. Um, and that's really the message that I want folks to take away. Um, this is a big, this is a big lift, and like I said, there are going to be lots of things that um, are not perfectly defined, and we're going to solve them together. That's what the right. city does. You're not going to have them all cleared up before you get started. That's for sure. That's certainly an important lesson. Another lesson I'd say to you, as someone that's on the outside looking in, is that you have some cooperative, very smart people, all three working very hard. We have a good start. We do have better people in New York City. So <laughs> you know that. No disrespect to your new uh, <laughs> All right, so um, I have your questions, or some of your questions here, and I'm hoping you'll have others that you'll pass along to the audience. And uh, Regina has a big part of the world. So I think what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll, I'll ask a question, and whoever, whichever of our panelists would like to take first stab at it will do so. And, uh, no, the person wants to add, add to that. Um, let's do it. Um, and the first one is actually something I've seen the answer to this, and it's pretty impressive to me. And let's see if what I've heard is right. What is the expenditure per pupil for UPK? Do we know that answer? I mean, I've seen an answer. Yeah. So, um, well, the 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 way the state um, the state law was written. Um, there are two answers, um, and there's one answer for a classroom that is led by a, uh, a teacher that's certified to teach um, universal pre-kindergarten, and there's another answer for a classroom that's led by a teacher that is not certified. Um, the answer is um, for a teacher, for, for one that's uh, led by a certified teacher, the total reimbursement to the city by the state is $10,000. And for, um, a, for a classroom that's led by uh, a, 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 an uncertified teacher, the total reimbursement from the state to the city is $7,000. Um, um, and so, and we are still, I want to hasten to add that um, new law, and this is going to sound, you know, this is a, a government answer, so uh, here we go. You know, new law is complicated, um, and, and um, especially, um, um, you know, as part of a process like the one we went through in launching a new program. And so um, many, many people are working in good faith um, to sort out how exactly the mechanics of that will work and how the funds will flow. Um, and how we can use that to build the system that we've planned. Um, and we're doing that while working with other community-based partners um, and, our public, and, our, and our colleagues in the public schools um, to ensure top quality and, and that we're going to have the system up and running this fall. Um, so uh, those are the numbers that are in the bill. 
Um, and meanwhile, we are working out with our partners in the schools um, uh, what that will look like on the ground. I just want to add one point to, clar to add to that point is that so that $10,000 or $7,000 are the reimbursements from New York State to New York City to run the system. So that includes the direct costs that the community early childhood center would have running the program. It includes the cost of uh, professional development or other system thing that the city is building in order to support the implementation of that program. Um, and again, we're, we're working every day with state education department um, to figure out about how this will actually work in practice. And don't forget that the national average that I mentioned to you earlier for preschool is $5,000. So the other part of the question that I asked just now that I didn't read them out is, is that enough? And I guess we'll have to see, but it's better than what, what is typically the case. So um, that's, that's a place to begin. Um, there are so many questions here, and there's so many interesting questions. Uh, I don't know if Bank Street would like to put them online uh, just to have people and uh, have the people very actively involved in the program uh, see some of the, the issues that are here. Here's, here's one I think is, is very important. It hasn't been discussed here tonight. What programs or workshops are being developed for parents whose children will be in UPK to engage in a dialogue with educators to articulate what quality curriculum inquiry play means to their children since the expectations and success of UPK will depend on family involvement in one way or another. Uh, so again, I, I, I mean, I can ask you, Regina, to, to respond to that, but um, you're, you're, you're on the, essentially, you're, you're not making up the rules. I'm not right? making up the policy. So, but it'd be uh, great, so it would be great to hear, uh, if I can, though, it'd be great to hear from Regina, you know, just as a model for us in thinking about this, what kind of parent engagement you do at Goddard Riverside and how you think about it. That'll also give Rich and I time to think about an answer. Okay. <laughs> um, well, we have, we have a, a partnership with the Museum of Natural History. So our four-year-olds go every week with their parents um, for a class in the museum. So we have training for the parents about the science at the museum, um, which helps to, them to get ready, actually, to help get their children ready for the fifth grade tests. So they really start, believe it or not, in pre-K <laughs> to um, start to teach them all the science stuff uh, to sort of get them up to, to level. Uh, we have, we have met parent me monthly meetings. We have parent trainings. We, uh, we have uh, support for English language learners. Um, I think parent, probably the most important thing is the teacher meeting each month and explaining what the curriculum is, how they can help their children at home. We send books home with the parents and encourage them to read every night. We have them in both English and Spanish. Um, we have parents volunteering in the classroom all of the time. Um, we ask them to bring in things from their own home life so that children frequently share cooking with their parents and um, bring it into the classroom. So uh, we're, we're a very small, strong unit. Um, I'm not sure how that extrapolates to a broad, a broad school system. Sounds I guess great. classroom at a time. Sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. so I'll say something which will probably be wrong and then Josh can correct me. Um, but I, I guess what I would say is, you know, at the Children's Aid Society, similarly, parent engagement was a central part of our work in multiple ways, both in terms of supporting parents to be effective partners in their children's education, but also in building a support network so that we could use the experience of children being in our programs to connect families to the broader way of services that Children's Aid Society provides, right? Um, I do not, there is not going to be a cookie cutter way that every organization provides parent engagement. Um, some organizations will look robust like Guided Riverside and Children's Aid Society, I imagine Others will not for a variety of reasons because they don't, they may not have the, the resources or the infrastructure that a large nonprofit might or a nonprofit that has a broader mission of supporting families might. I think part of our job in the system and part of the way that uh, coaching and monitoring comes into play is to make sure that programs are thinking, given their context and their ability, given the limitation of their context or their capacity, but to make sure that programs understand the central role that parents play as the first educators in their child's life, and to bring those resources and awareness to program. But there is not a universal model that says every program has to have this 
parent education program, and somewhat by design because we've built we've built a, a more diverse system than that. I think, like everything else, over time, one of the reasons to evaluate a system is to understand what's working and what's not working, and how we approach that might change over time based on what we learn. One of, this may be one of the things you don't necessarily have to evaluate in order to find out that you need to do it. Well, of course, of course. But I, I mean in the context of understanding. No, of course, but I, but I do mean seriously, in, in, as we have a lot of things that we're trying to accomplish with lots of organizations and, try, and with lots of inputs that drive quality, um, with always limited resources, we are gonna be making choices every day, every year about um, what to emphasize, what to invest in, what to support. Um, and, and so I do think there is a process over time which says where we have to put more emphasis in supporting the field or where the field might be doing relatively well where greater emphasis may not be necessary. So here's a question about more resources. And there are a lot of questions here about more and more resources. It says here, there's a lot of focus on pre-K when the research suggests it's important to invest our precious resources on children uh, in birth to three, birth to four, and their families. How do we ensure policy follows the research and best practices around this? We oppose okay. birth to three. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think from, from our perspective, um, you know, it won't, we, we, we have to focus on, on the entire continuum. Um, and universal pre-kindergarten, we feel, is foundational to that, um, but not the end of the conversation. And, you know, both the deputy mayor and I uh, at Children's Aid Society worked on birth to five programs. It was a continuum that began um, with uh, a home-based early Head Start program. Um, and then led um, after building um, very deep relationships with families, uh, it led into center-based work um, and into pre-kindergarten and then oftentimes into, into community schools. And so that, uh, that approach is, is um, foundational to us. I, I do think that um, we are, as we focus on the implementation of universal pre-kindergarten, we are also working hard with our colleagues at the Administration for Children's Services um, to think about the work um, that they are doing um, um, with, with both four-year-olds and three-year-olds. Um, and I think we are interested um, as well, although I think during our days at this point, we're, we're pretty focused on the task at hand, um, but we're, we know the power of, of early intervention um, and, and programs that are run out of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, which is also a part of our UPK working groups, um, and other powerful programs that are run by um, not-for-profits around the city. And, and, um, and some of the people who work in those programs are part of our conversations about early childhood and the course that this system will take over time. And so I take the point. I think it's a really important one. Um, and we know the importance of it. And we keep it in mind as we're building this very important piece out. So let's um, move the conversation uh, to yet another dimension of uh, importance. And I asked Regina, talk about children with disabilities who are in your program. And then I'd like to ask uh, Rich and uh, Josh to talk about how that fits into UPK. Um, so when children come into the program, within the first 45 days, um, we are required to do something called a brigance, which is a, a, an assessment. And between that assessment and Usually observations from the teachers, concerns from the parents. We have a, a meeting with a parent and talk about whether they feel their child needs an evaluation for services. Um, frequently, the, the parents are supportive and the children are included in the program. They usually have a SEAT, which is a special education itinerary teacher, which I'm sure everybody here knows, um, that works with them many hours a week, depending on, on what the, the child's quote unquote disability is. So um, some of those practices, uh, are they gonna be included in this as well? Yeah, a universal system is a universal system. It's a system for uh, students with special needs. It's a, stu a system for English language learners. It's a system for everyone. Um, although I, today I learned, a, uh, I'm sure this is not a new phrase, but I learned a beautiful phrase, an alternative to English language learners that, 
um, to describe them as emerging bilingual speakers, which I just love as an elegant way of describing that population. But, but yes, it's a system for everyone. And, and we, we do have an, ex, like an explicit goal, sort of learning from Head Start, uh, of inclusion um, and trying to, um, uh, if, we, you know, if we can, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, include um, children with special needs um, in pre-K programs in various settings. Um, and then to focus on some of the early assessment that Regina's talking about um, and help find the right path for each student. Okay, UPK fours will be full day. What's gonna happen with the existing half day kindergarten program? So some will be, so part of the process of expansion is that some of those half day programs this fall will be converted to full day programs. Um, and then by next year, more of those half-day programs will be converted to full-day programs. And the idea is to move the vast majority of the system to full-day seats. And we're going to be informed. Um, we are planning uh, to, to do a survey of families. Um, and this won't be the only way that we figure out how to design um, a full implementation system. But it will be an important clue um, because we do have anecdotal and some focus group information that gives us some evidence that there are certain um, parts of the city that might have, prefer half day for various reasons, and we do want to we do want to try to meet the needs of of, of families. So that will be one um, piece uh, that we use to make those decisions. But we will have a certain number of half day seats in the system. We 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 believe that that will be the case. Okay, another one, Regina. I imagine that you have uh, families who need more than six hours and twenty minutes of care for their children. Definitely. And um, so you have before school, after school, you have a longer day, that kind of thing. Well, we are right now a, a Head Start UPK program. Um, as, I, as I said, I don't know what we will be in the future, but as a, as a Head Start UPK, we are open from 8.30 to 3.30. We also have at some of our other sites, we have daycare. And so those are, those are also UPK programs, and they're open from 8 to 6. So how does that play into So I'll start and you can figure, so you know, that just, so a new UPK slot would not supplant um, an existing early learn slot, for example. So I, I do want to make that clear. It doesn't take away from the slot you already have. If you're applying for new slots, it's a new slot. It does not supply, uh, supplant in, for those who don't know early learn, early learn is New York City's uh, blended stream that includes UPK daycare, um, Head Start, that allows to have full year program from eight to six. Um, UPK is not a full day, it's not a, well, it's not a year-round program. It's not an eight to six program. It is a six hour and 20 minute program, 180 days. It is much more like a school year program. Um, and and, and I, I will say for lots of, and I'll keep coming back to this, this is both a monumental step forward. It's also an incremental step forward at the same time. And you know, I, I reflect that four months ago, most people were saying we were gonna have the money for those 180 days, six hours and 20 minutes, that, that what we were discussing was not even possible. And so I, I think I, I want us always to understand that um, even our, our, in our hard work to build a great system, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be a perfect system. It's not gonna solve the problem of every working parent. Um, but I do think we're making tremendous steps forward. And I think our job over the long term uh, is to understand how we continue to continue to build a better system for more families. And it's also important to remember, and again, it's part of the power of having this diverse system in New York, um, that there are going to be any number of community organizations that are running early childhood centers who, through additional resources and supports, m will be able to offer extended day programs or, or summer programs, not through UPK funding, but through other funding streams. Um, and uh, I, I think it's important for that to grow. And part of the parents' job in our community is the is to go out and find the program that works best for them. And if you use UPK as the core of the program and the sliding fee scale for the time before and after, and some of explore. There are all sorts of things that a community organization could do right. outside of those six hours and 20 minutes that don't impact the publicly paid free time. I think we're going to, uh, again, I'll just say quickly and add that I think we'll learn a lot from the way neighborhood-based organizations respond to this. And part of, part of it is incumbent upon us to watch and learn and try to assist. But I do think, as, as Deputy Mayor is saying, I think that a lot of these organizations are thinking through creative strategies to make it work for working families, um, and we'll learn a lot from that. Okay, another logistical question. 
And I can't, I, I hope that you don't expect that they have every answer, because you can't. <laughs> and that's what they're saying. I mean, just, just, but all right, I'll give it to you anyhow. Uh, just as in decisions regarding whose streets are snowplowed first, and I gotta tell you, I've seen uh -oh. mayors lose their jobs over this sort of thing, but not here, or maybe. Or yeah, here too. In <laughs> one priority, that is, what strategies can you identify that are being implemented regarding which areas are gonna be rolled out first in this? Okay. Sure. <laughs> so, um, so the one of the um, interesting things about um, rolling out a universal program is, is that at first uh, you can be very broad uh, um, in the way you you look at this question. So, um, we did a couple of things. Uh, one is we put out um, um, a solicitation to all public school principals, and the chancellor did this herself. Um, encouraging them to raise their hand and say that they would offer universal pre-kindergarten in their schools. Um, and so, and we, we took, we, we, we met with the principals and looked at whether they had the space and the ability, the capacity to provide quality UPK, and they had a plan to do that. Um, and we started there, and we knew that we would need those seats, and so we added them on based on the principles that could demonstrate their desire and their capacity to provide a quality program. Um, that's, and so we, we let the, the group of principles essentially make that decision at first. Um, and then the second step is we, we did a very broad solicitation and we're about to do um, a, a second solicitation, by the way, to community-based organizations around New York City. And there we looked at, um, uh, um, where four-year-olds are versus where the seats are. Um, and so um, we were looking at um, uh, the, the sort of need for UPK based on that universal metric, um, where the four-year-olds um, were living versus how many seats uh, we could provide. And so we are still evaluating the results of that. And as we, as we do that, trying to map, um, as I put it before, sort of supply versus demand. Um, but that's the way we're looking at the rollout. We know um, that, uh, as, as the Debbie Mayor alluded to before, um, there will be neighborhoods in this first year uh, where there might be more supply or more demand. And I think as we move into year two, uh, which the mayor has set for us as the year of full implementation, we will have to do some careful work with schools and communities and families to essentially find the right balance in the system um, to match those. So can I just add two other quick thoughts. Um, one, please stop calling me deputy mayor. <laughs> um, the two, three, additional, right. three additional thoughts. All right. um, <laughs> three additional thoughts. Um, I'm sorry. No, Josh it's... and I are, are friends. So I'm just, I'm just teasing. Uh, so um, one of that, you know, one of the, you know, one of the factors in making those, those matches in this year is who actually is able to open this space in September, right? So there is a real estate overlay to this. Um, uh, in that you, you have to, if you're a community or early child center, just like a, a, a public school, you have to demonstrate that you have space that can actually be brought online by September. And so one of the places, I mean, I talked earlier about the um, expectations gap. One of the things that may come to play in neighborhoods is that the real estate gaps might just be more dynamic, and so we're going to need more time to address those more complex needs. And that's part of the work we're doing now, is looking ahead to year two and beyond to say, what are the longer term real estate strategies we have to achieve, particularly in those neighborhoods where there might be that gap? Um, the other thing I was going to say is that uh, Josh mentioned the solicitation um, for community based organizations. We're also doing another um, for charter schools, um, which I think is being released Friday, that want to participate in universal pre kindergarten. Um, and so there are actually two other solicitations one for charter schools and one for additional community-based organization that want to apply to host pre-K programs. That's right, and I would just uh, add one more piece which I think is really important, which is that uh, as with the public schools, when we, when we solicit community-based early childhood centers, um, we are trying to, we're being as rigorous as we can uh, about looking for high quality programs. And so that's the filter that we're using. It's, it's not just the need in the neighborhood, but also, again, who has, um, who, can, who can show a plan for good quality space, but also to recruit or retain high quality teachers who can show good practice in the classroom uh, and has a, either a track record of doing that or can show us the expertise that will be needed to bring it online, who has a thoughtful curriculum or approach to teaching. All those things are going into a very um, 
a very a good and solid um, evaluation process that includes a site visit for every site um, with the teachers and with the directors um, to make sure that uh, um, we're going to have uh, the best quality. And let me say that there have been many, many of these questions have to do with quality. I'm not going to, we're not going to go there right this second. It's something that takes a lot more thought and uh, development than what we can do off the, off the cuff. But it's, a, of course, we all use this word. We don't use it the same way. Mm -hmm. So it'll take a lot of work. Well, one more question. Uh, Regina mentioned the Brigants and Eckers and Class, and, mm -hmm. and we have all of these uh, acronyms available to us. Um, and so the question is, uh, will there be a system whereby specific curricula are approved? Will there be a common assessment system? Mm -hmm. So, you want me to yeah. Do? <laughs> um, so at the, at, at the moment, and this is a system in evolution, we, we do not um, prescribe curricula. Um, uh, so, so we do not like, you know, um, we do, you know, so if you look at Boston, for example, that is, um, you know, implementing um, OWL and building blocks throughout, that is not, you know, the approach that we're not, no knock on Boston, it's a wonderful program, but that's just not the approach we've decided to take in a system as big and as diverse as this one. Um, and I think the other sort of choice was, you know, is, is there a menu of options as in the Abbott pre-K program? But what we've decided to do instead is that um, as we're evaluating programs that apply for universal pre-kindergarten and as our coaches continue to work with programs through implementation, we want to make sure that they're using an approach um, that is, uh, you know, based in research and evidence that shows that, that has a track record of of um, demonstrating that it helps uh, the whole child develop and that it is aligned with the, the, the state common core pre-K standards and that it's developmentally appropriate uh, and that it fosters these rich interactions in the program. And if, and, and actually um, when we were at Children's Aid, we went through the process of rolling out a new curriculum in our centers um, called Tools of the, for, new to us, not new to the world, called Tools of the Mind. Um, and um, we went through the process of working with the Department of Ed to get approval because not a lot of centers in our region had used this curriculum. And we went through a very, um, um, I think, great and, and, um, and rich process with uh, their instructional coach to map uh, tools of the mind to those standards and show how our practice in the classroom was achieving those goals. Um, and it might have, you know, and, and that was a good, structured helpful interaction so that's that's what we hope to do we want to give a lot of um, um, we want to give we want to learn from the best practices in New York City we want to allow for a diverse practice um, but we want to make sure that we're uh, adhering to quality standards uh, um, and that we're, we're we're using best practice and just to repeat myself again we will also adapt and adjust as we learn more so the way it looks now, it may not look that way in three years. It will depend on what we learn. Um, you know, there's obviously exciting research going on right now. On um, uh, so we, we will adapt and learn as we learn more. Uh, there was another part of the question besides curriculum, which I forgot. Assessment. Uh, oh, assessment, no. yeah. So uh, again, so you know, we um, you know, we talked about this before. The Department of Education has a comprehensive system that does use things like Eckers in class to evaluate quality. Um, and part of what we're doing now is, is sort of uh, evaluating that system, in a sense, to make sure that um, we have a system of support, oversight, and coaching that we believe is going to help us to promote quality in programs the way we have before. So the Department of Education already has a system, and what we're doing is working now to refine that system. Regina, can you answer? Oh, actually, I'd, I'd like to ask a question about um, how, many, how many teachers each coach will be working with. What's the number? So the, 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 the way, the, the, there's a number that the Department of Ed will have. So we uh, were able to move the number, last year it was one coach for 60 classrooms. And this, with this expansion, oh, hold on, with this expansion. So what you were ordering much. It's good, it's right. Um, uh, with this expansion, it, it goes down to one to 45. That is still, oh, there's more, wait, there's more. So that is the, that is the number of coaches you know, uh, at the Department of Ed that will be visiting various programs. Um, I would hasten to add, though, that I do think that unlike in other um, systems, we do have 
um, this network of community-based early childhood centers that have, in some cases, education directors that play a very similar role. And so we do hope to leverage that. At, that is part of our answer. And so the coaches that will go out from DOE will do some of this coaching directly, but also will uh, you know, tr uh, train the trainers, so to speak, and try to offer turnkey professional development to education directors who, who can then in turn provide more guidance and support to classroom teachers. So we are trying to, we are, we are building the system. Um, we did make a, a big step forward um, and, and we'll continue from here. Well, at this point, I think we're gonna stop with the questions, uh, which uh, I think will be a great relief to Josh and to Rich, at least. Um, we've done a great job, and I think we owe all three of our families uh, Thank you for joining us for the Niemeyer Lecture this year, and uh, we hope you'll continue the discussion out in the hallway uh, within the next week or so. This uh, session will be up on our website, and you can go back to it over and over again, and we will make sure that uh, all of the questions appear somewhere there, too, for you to, to review. Uh, it was really affirming that we had over 80 questions from the audience. So again, thank you so much, and thank you for our panelists.